welcome to the podcast for Ray Church of the Nazarene. I'm Ben Beckner, Senior Pastor, and I'm glad that you have tuned in to listen to our services and sermons. We would also love to have you join us in person at 410 Blake Street in Ray, Colorado, for our Sunday morning worship services that begin at 1045. We also have Sunday school classes for all ages that begin at 945, and a Spanish service that begins at 9 a.m. There are also various other activities and Bible studies that you can be involved in throughout the week, including youth group and children's quizzing. Please visit our website at raynazarene.com and our Facebook page for more information. We have something for everyone to encounter God with people just like you desiring to grow in their relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, thank you and welcome to our podcast. for Ray Church the Nazarene. This week's episode is entitled Unity, God's Way and comes from the book of Ezra, chapter 3. Thanks again for listening. Well, it is so good, like I said, to be with you. It has been kind of a crazy week. Um, I am learning a lot and realizing more and more the things I don't know, and I'm thankful for you as a church family that has really come around myself and my family to welcome us and to uh, have us be a part of you, and so thank you for for doing that. You have loved us well, and uh, we're looking forward with much anticipation to the days ahead, and um, this morning I thought Um, as we continue to move forward, um, where my heart has been, and I want to share that with you and kind of where I feel like God is leading us moving forward. Uh, Last week, I shared a passage out of Ezra chapter 3, the first three verses. Um, Out of those three verses, uh, some themes that stood out to me that I think um, I want to spend some time moving forward as a church body together. Out of verse 1, we talked about this theme of unity. Verse 2 is a commitment to God and his word. And verse 3 was follow and obey despite our fears. This morning, let's read Ezra chapter 3 together if we can. I've kind of messed with our our sound and media guys this morning a little bit. They're having to jump back and forth. I appreciate you, and I do not want to make your job difficult, but thank you for helping me with this. So, If you can and are able, would you stand as we read out of Ezra chapter 3 this morning? When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began to build the altar of of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings in accordance with what was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. Let's pray. Father, this morning we come to you. And we're thankful again for this opportunity. We ask God that you would bless this time together, the reading of your word, this message today. And I pray, God, that it would be your words, your message today. We ask these things, Father, in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So over the next few weeks, as I shared these three themes that I've seen here in Ezra chapter 3, The first one this morning is unity. And unity is kind of a funny thing. Um, We struggle, I think, at times um, defining it and applying it in a biblical and faithful manner. Even though it's mentioned numerous times in the New Testament, it seems to be that there's kind of two extremes in how this unity is often tried to, to be applied. On one extreme, we have we focus on where we agree and we set aside all the things and all the areas where we don't. And so what happens with that is sometimes sound doctrine, uh, theology, things like that are cast aside 
so that we can all come together and sing Kumbaya or we are one in the spirit. And that's not always a good thing. Then on the other side of that, we have another extreme where we separate ourselves and disagree on minor and non-essential things. Some of us or some people get real hung up that there really is only one version of the Bible, and that's the King James Version. And there are others that uh, say that you have issues with how you're dressed on a Sunday morning and come to church. I didn't wear my suit today, not in protest, but just um, <laughs> anyway. So we have these, these kind of two extremes. And I believe somewhere in the middle, God has an idea for us on what unity should look like and how we need to participate in that. We can look at the different types of unity this morning. And so as we begin to kind of frame this and begin to understand it, follow along with me here as we talk about these, two, these different types of unity. So this first one, individual. This individual unity is where every true believer is one with every other true believer. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, right? We, um, we can encourage and we can enjoy the fellowship of one another when we have that common bond, that common unity. The next level or next um, type would be a church-to-church -church type of unity. And I've heard some, some pretty amazing stories of how this has worked in this community. Um, we work with churches that hold to the truth of the gospel but may hold differing secondary doctrine. So we can come together on areas of evangelism. And I've heard about this, this revival that you guys participated in, and that is an amazing thing. That is a great example of church-to-church -church unity. We can come together in the ways that we help the poor. We can come together in, in meeting needs. We can come together in serving. Another one is we can come together in praying for our community and praying for concerns and tragedies that happen. And so when we're able as a church at large to come together, be able to kind of put some as the, put aside the, these secondary issues, but come together on these main things, the body of Christ is exemplified. And so we want to work towards those type of things. We can even as a church partner or, be, or unify with community involvement as well, but we need to be a little bit careful there because we can come together on, on some of these social issues, but on spiritual matters, that's not where we can join. And so as we do that, we can partner with groups that are advancing laws to protect the unborn. We can work with those that are promoting traditional family values and securing those. We can work with those that um, or working towards anti-drug policies, those type of things. We can come together on some of these things that benefit not only the body of Christ, but our community as well. And so as we work and think about unity going forward as Ray Church of the Nazarene, these are some of the areas that we want to, to do that. To help us understand that a bit more, we need to talk about what unity is. Now, if we make this, this baseline and, and are able to establish some basic truths, then that helps us as we move forward to discover areas that we can be unified and areas that we need to be careful. So we must establish these. And so seeing this up here, I know now that it's a lot harder for you to see than I thought it would. So my apologies. But these areas that we can establish and uh, these essential truths would be in these areas of salvation. So we believe in the inspiration and authority of scripture. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in the deity and humanity of Christ. We believe in his substitutionary death on the cross. We believe in his resurrection and his second coming. We believe in salvation by grace through faith and not by works. And I don't know how many of you have noticed in our hallway, there's these cards that have our articles of faith. And those are amazing, and I would encourage you to read through those and study those, because those are principles, again, that help us move forward and how we are going to attain this unity. So, 
That's what unity is, what unity is not. Again, these are areas that we need to be careful as we move forward. This organizational unity. We're going to spend some time out of John chapter 17, but that's where Jesus is praying for believers and I believe for the church as well, that we are, are careful in how we um, approach this. We do not join or partner with groups or churches who differ theologically or who deny or compromise the gospel. Jesus was praying for this and not in a one world, one church, and one government type of approach, but as a body of believers that are coming together for that one common purpose of promoting the gospel. Unity is not uniformity. This does not mean that we all look alike, that we all talk alike, that we all enjoy the same thing. The body of Christ needs the different for it to operate and function appropriately. 1 Corinthians 12 verses 12 through 13. If you have your Bibles, we're going we're gonna to come back to this passage again, but I want to read this to you this morning. Just as one body, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, it is so with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So again, Paul is trying to get us to understand that it is that unity that we are supposed to strive for. This unity that is common through this connection with Jesus Christ. Why is unity important? And I think that that's where we want to spend most of our time here this morning as we, as we talk about this. Why do we want to strive towards this? What purpose does this have for ultimately the body, and the church. I want to read this morning from John chapter 17. And we're going to read verses 20 through 23. Maybe? No? Okay, that's all right. John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. Again, this is Jesus' prayer right before he was crucified. And here he is, he's praying for his disciples and, and followers. Verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I love, I love this passage. Here we get a glimpse at just kind of the heart of what Jesus desired for each one of us. We need to understand as we as we explore this idea of unity and strive towards it, that the first step is this unity between us and the Father. For us to achieve any other unity outside of that, we're, we're kind of spinning our wheels. We encounter, sorry, I lost my place. This unity between the Father and us, we encounter when we accept Christ as our Savior, when, when we begin that relationship, when, when we have decided that the way that we have lived is not going to work any longer, when we have decided to lay aside our own life and join it with His. So this first step, this first encounter affects everything else outside of that. This first step of unity where we are one with the Father affects how we become one with each other. It affects our relationships and the encounters between ourselves and others outside of us. This unity affects the way we work together, the way we work with one another, the way that we love one another. 
It brings together different people for a unifying purpose. And that unifying purpose is the hope of the gospel made known around us. <coughs> when, we, when we decide that unity in this way needs to be what we need to strive for, that's something that's attractive to non-believers. It affects the way that the world sees what we have. And that should be something that we need to be striving for. Verse 23, he, again, Jesus gives this indication that the world may know. This, this unity that the church needs to have is something that is very different from what the world sees. It's not very difficult for us to see, and as we watch the news, if we're on social media, any of those things, how divided of a nation and a country we are. Values, um, missions, um, all kinds of different things are, we have this great divide between the two. And this unifying work that Jesus does through the cross that brings us together is something that the world doesn't see very often. And I think as the church, oftentimes we maybe don't do a good enough job in being unified as well. I think sometimes the things that we say, the way that we interact with one another is not very unifying. And that's something that, that we want to, as Ray Church of the Nazarene, be different that we want to come together, that we want to be unified in the right ways. And I haven't been around here long enough to say that this doesn't happen, but this is what I feel is on my heart as we continue to move forward. So I hope you're not reading into something with what I'm saying there, that I've seen something that, that shouldn't be taking place. That's not it. But how we as a church family want to move together, that this is attractive to the world around us. And we want to draw others and ultimately point them to Jesus. This unity is what is one of the things that will do that. So, how do we begin to achieve that? Unity comes as we mature in Christ. <coughs> it becomes as we it comes as we grow in the knowledge of his word, as we as we grow in, in the character of who he is. Genesis one tells us that we were made in his image. And so knowing that and understanding that as we work towards becoming more and more like him, this unity becomes more and more evident. It's something that we desire as believers, but we need to be careful that we're not compromising our beliefs to attain. So our relationships with all believers. This is where family, when we start rubbing elbows with one another, Sometimes things get a little hard and a little difficult because there are times in my own family that my kids, as much as I love them, I also want to strangle them. <laughs> and I think some of you can kind of relate to that, that the differences, these, these relationships, these, these close quarters sometimes create some, some friction. But we also understand, too, that, that as we work towards this, that the way that I talk and interact, and the way that you talk and interact, ultimately, we are moving towards something that God wants us for as unity. The Apostle Paul wrote, writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Ah. Bearing with one another in love. We can't do that on our own. But because of what Jesus does within us, because of the work of the Spirit, we are able to do that and work towards that. Paul also writes in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Man, that is something to attain, isn't it? 
to be known as a body of believers that we put on love, that we are bound together in perfect unity because of the work that Jesus does in each one of our lives. So as we strive towards this unity with the Father ourselves, that begins to transform the way that we interact with one another. It changes the way that we view one another, the way that we talk one another, the way that we love one another. So, relationships with all believers. Next, the way we, we attain unity is we need to display racial and cultural and social unity and diversity. I think in my short time here that this church does a good job with this, that we have a congregation that reflects parts of our community. And that doesn't happen everywhere. In fact, the church that I came from, this was an area where we kind of felt like we struggled a little bit. And in fact, the church where we were located was in a kind of a rough part of town. And we were known among the others in that community as the rich white church. We did not do well in interacting and engaging with our community. And our Sunday mornings did not properly reflect the community we lived in. And so I see Ray Church of the Nazarene as, some, as, as a body of believers that is striving to do that. And we need to continue to do that. Our congregations need to come together in ways we're on the same team and we're going the same place. And that is an amazing thing. And it's something that is attractive. People are drawn to that. So I would encourage you to keep doing that. Paul also addressed this in Galatians 3, verses 26 through 28. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So, the ways that we attain unity is our relationships with all believers. We display racial, cultural, social unity and diversity. And acceptance and appreciation of different gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul devotes that entire chapter to a, trying to attain this. He was speaking to a church that was very fractured in many areas and disunit, disunified. Um, it was a mess. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he is just trying to encourage this, this body, this group of believers to recognize the differences the, the unique gifts and abilities that each one has and how that needs to function as the body of Christ. And I want to draw your attention to one particular verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just as a body, <coughs> excuse me, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. And that needs to be something that we, as Ray Church of the Nazarene, as we push and strive towards becoming a unified body, that we need to learn how to work together as a many different parts form one body. The different things, the things that make us different are things that help us actually to function the way that it should. Because I'm not going to see things the way that you see things. I'm not going to respond the way that you would respond. And so when we come together as a body, we're able to glorify God in ways that the world needs to see. This is attractive. And as we want to grow, as we want to make a kingdom impact in Ray, these are the, one of the first things that we need to do is come together as a unified body. This morning, we're going to participate in communion. And I couldn't think of a better way to experience the unity of the body of Christ in this way. Communion is is not something that, that we have set up as, as some special thing, but Jesus Christ himself set it up. Jesus invites us to come to, together in this way. Scripture talks about we need to be a little bit careful because this isn't something that we need to take lightly. Communion is something that we come together in a way that, again, points back to the very first point of unity, and that's with our relationship with him. 
So this morning, if that's you, if maybe you don't have that relationship with Christ, it is a great day to begin that relationship. It is a great opportunity to do this because this is the first step in unity. So I think we have a couple of guys that are helping with this. I'm a little new in how you guys are, are doing this. So you guys that are going to help me this morning, if you can come forward. And we're going to open the table this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is giving instructions to this church on how they need to participate in communion. And I referenced a, a verse and a passage, obviously out of 1 Corinthians 12, earlier on, about the different parts of the body becoming one. In chapter 11, he gives the instructions for the Lord's Supper. Verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this morning, as we participate in communion together, this is a great opportunity to celebrate the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. I invite you to come this morning. I think, if I'm understanding correctly, you're going to come down the center aisle. You can come to Chris or Kurt. You're going to break off a piece of bread, and you're going to dip it. And you may participate and take your communion that way. And then you return back to your seat. All right? Let's pray. If you can stand, would you please do so with me?